Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome to Theology in Perspective. I'm Dr. Daniel Woodhead and I'm your host. I'm blessed that you could join us again. We've been doing Christmas messages or messages that are related to the time that Christ came and about his arrival. In today's message, I want to continue with that uh, series and talk about the divine intervention into time and space, into this world by God in the body of our Lord Jesus. And this is divine intervention. There's no question about it. Uh, from Galatians 4, verses 3 to 7, we see, Even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You know, the world's population is locked into the sinful ways of this world. It's what Paul calls the elements of the world. And prior to the advent of Jesus, the Jews were like slaves to sin. That is, they, they were children that had spiritual immaturity, but driven by the urges that entered their minds. And this is still the state of the unsaved in this world. The Jews were and still are locked into the basic principles of the Mosaic Law. This has run its course since the Jewish Messiah has come and fulfilled its requirements for all to take advantage of. The Gentiles, they're in bondage too, but they're under the miserable principles of the various heathen religions of this world. Both Jews and Gentiles are locked into life guidance principles that can best be described as slavery, which Paul uses the term bondage. Uh, and they're in, they're, they're in slavery or in bondage of some set of rules for life that are not what God intends for the human race. Since the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, God sent up the redemption of mankind we see that in Genesis 3.15, a verse is called the Proto-Evangelism. It, 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 it specifies that God's going to send the seed of the woman. Now, women don't have seeds. Men have seeds. The seed gets implanted into the woman. But the woman to have a seed is a supernatural conception. So he would send his Messiah to the earth to emancipate the earth through his teaching but actually through his death and resurrection. Those were the events that caused the emancipation of the earth for all those who will believe. So God himself stepped forth in divine intervention to bring hope and freedom to mankind. Just like a father has chosen a time for his child to be designated as an adult, so too did our Heavenly Father choose a time to bring Christ, his son, to earth. He designated the perfect time in all of world history to send himself in the body of a human to make provision for the world's transition from bondage under the law, or pagan cults, if you will, to spiritual sonship. <clears throat> he prepared the world in several ways that are very apparent. Now, the concept of the fullness of time that Paul cites is what I want to touch on for the rest of our message today. God decided that the preparation of 4,000 years since he first announced his coming in Genesis 3.15 to Adam, Eve, and Satan would be fulfilled. He chose the perfect time and he made all the adequate preparations and it, it shouldn't have been a surprise to those who love him and know his word, but it was. 
And Jesus wept over the fact that the Jews lacked an understanding regarding the timing of his appearance on this earth. Their lack of recognition of the timing of God's appearance to them in the greatest ever appearance of the Shekinah glory led to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman soldiers in 70 AD. <clears throat> You know, in the 19th chapter of Luke, starting in verse 42, Jesus said, and here's the description now, now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation you know prophecy that had been given to the Jewish prophets regarding Christ's appearance on this earth and, and the Jewish leader just disregarded them even though they knew of them they intellectually understood their details but they didn't take them to heart as a direct message from God you know from 2 Corinthians 3 6 we see the term the letter killeth <clears throat> but the spirit gives life and we see this principle God gave his strict law but it is meant to lead us to God's Spirit. The law is a teacher, not a savior. The Jews have become so deeply adherent to God's law, they didn't see its intent. It was a teacher meant to lead us to him and a relationship with him. The law was fulfilled in Jesus and his teaching. You know, the entire Sermon on the Mount was directed at the Pharisees who were so deeply immersed in the specifics of the law, they didn't recognize its central message. <clears throat> Frequently in the Sermon on the Mount, which is directed at the Pharisees, the Lord Jesus said, You have heard it said by them of old, but I say unto you. And in doing that, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he's describing the Pharisees' pickiness over the details and not seeing the intent of the law. They did the same thing with the prophecies of his first advent. One example, <clears throat> when the Magi visited Herod, he immediately conferred with the chief priests and the scribes to learn where the Messiah was going to be born. And they told him that in Micah 5, 2, it said in Bethlehem of Judea. So they all knew what the scripture said, but they didn't take any of it to heart for their personal, spiritual belief and benefit. God says that he does nothing except he first reveals it through his prophets. That's from Amos 3, 7. But it's interesting, God gives this prophet Daniel the exact day of his appearance. Ninth chapter of Daniel, starting in the 20th verse, Daniel now is speaking in the first person, and he says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Jehovah my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he instructed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee wisdom and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment went forth, and I am come to tell thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, Consider the manner and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, <clears throat> and to anoint the most holy. No, therefore, and discern that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the anointed one, the prince, shall be seven weeks, 
and threescore weeks and two weeks, and it shall be built again, the street and moat even in troublous times. And after the threescore and two weeks shall the anointed one be cut off and shall have nothing. Now, Daniel was taken captive in 605 BC by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he was taken there. During that time, he became the prime minister, the chief of the Magi, if you will, but he was a devoted prophet of God. While praying one evening, he was visited by Gabriel, the angel, <clears throat> with a message of the Messiah's appearance on earth. This is the same Gabriel that appeared to Mary when he had impregnated her. Now, this vision, or had uh, managed it because it was an impregnation by the Holy Spirit, so this vision specified some length of time that must pass before the Messiah would appear. Now, Gabriel further said that the Messiah, the anointed one, would be killed. <clears throat> and uh, I didn't. what I didn't say was that he would die, but not for himself. In other words, this Messiah was going to die for others, for somebody else. Gabriel used the term seven weeks and three score weeks and two weeks to reference several pitiful, uh, pitiful events on God's timetable for the fullness of time to bring his Messiah. The Hebrew word here for sevens, plural, is shavuam. And it just means sevens. It refers to seven of something. The context governs the topic of which the sevens apply. So here, Daniel's praying about the 70 years of captivity and assumed it would end according to what the prophet Jeremiah had written. So that was from 29.10, Jeremiah 29.10, after 70 years. So the 70 sevens refers to seven, three score, or 60, and then two weeks, <clears throat> which actually work out to be 490 years. Seventy sevens of years. The starting event that would begin the countdown of this 490 years is the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The culminating event, which is the appearance of the Messiah on the earth, uh, as unto the anointed one, the prince is 62 weeks, or 483 years of the entire 490. <clears throat> You know, the Jews had been in Babylon when the Medes and the Persians conquered the Babylons, but the Medes and the Persians didn't have any reason to keep them captive, and they were told they'd go home and rebuild Jerusalem. According to Isaiah's prophecy, Cyrus the Persian, whom the Lord called his shepherd, would give this command and perform all his pleasure, and even saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, the foundation shall be laid. We see that in Isaiah 40 or 28. Now, I believe that God through Isaiah spoke accurately, as he always does, when he said that Cyrus would, would, would issue the decree for the restoration of the temple and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. But Artaxerxes issued a reaffirmation of this decree, which applied to the walls of Jerusalem, in 445 BC, and he issued this through Nehemiah. We see that in Nehemiah 2.8. So, <clears throat> if we count out from there, we can get to Jesus' appearance in Jerusalem. It's a simple mathematical prophecy. The Jewish and the Babylonian calendars use a 360-day year, so 69 weeks of 360 day years totals 173,880 days. In effect, Gabriel told Daniel that the interval between the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem until the presentation of Messiah the Prince or King would be 173,880 days. I'm going to put a chart up on uh, <clears throat> the overhead here so you can see the difference between the Jewish calendar and the Gregorian calendar the 365 days per year and they both when adjusted for leap years and so on uh, turn out to have the same 173,880 days and that's the key number here so that the date that the Jews were released from captivity in Babylon 
was March the 4th, 445 B.C. Now, accounting for the different calendars of the 360 day years and the 365 and a quarter days, we still come to the same 173,880 days to get to the date of April the 6th, 32 A.D. This is the date that Jesus presented himself on Palm Sunday as the Jewish king. Prior to that, he did not let them elevate him to being a king, but that day he did because that's what the prophet said when it would happen. He allowed them to call him king. And he said if they didn't, even the stones would cry out and say who he is. The Jews, who should have known this, they probably knew it in their minds, but not in their hearts. They knew their Messiah was coming from this prophecy, just as they knew where the, he was going to be born. But they ignored it. He was expected. You know, the historians record for us that at that time, at general time, there was a strange uh, expectation in the world that uh, a king was coming. A Roman historian Suetonius wrote in the Twelve Caesars that everybody knew this was going to happen. Everybody knew Tacitus, another Roman historian, says the same thing. There was a firm persuasion that at this time in the East, something was going to grow powerful and rulers coming from Judea were going to acquire a universal empire. Josephus talks about it in his Wars of the, of the, uh, of the Jews that this governor was going to come, governor of the habitable earth. Now, it's interesting, you know, that since the Babylonian captivity and the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C., rabbinic Judaism rose up with synagogues for teaching. Now, the oldest synagogue that we know of uh, from archaeological digs goes back to the 3rd century B.C., but they have an older history because we know that with the destruction of Solomon's temple, it gave rise to meeting in private homes uh, and then uh, synagogues after that used for religious instruction. The orthodox term shul provides additional information about the synagogue's primary function. It was a house of study. It was a place where Jewish men and male children received their religious education. These teaching facilities were ready to receive Jesus and his apostles after him. By the time of Christ, there were synagogues all over Israel and in many cities of the world uh, that the Romans had conquered. <clears throat> this helped to spread Christianity. You know, Paul is mentioned in a number of places in the book of Acts as going into synagogues in Damascus, Salamis. Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Thessalonica, and Berea, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus. My goodness. <clears throat> Look what uh, the Lord did here. Uh, I'm going to read to you from Luke 4, verses 16 to 21. And so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to them, and they marveled at his gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? <clears throat> you know, what's interesting is Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, and now there were synagogues all over the Roman Empire. Here, as he was teaching in the synagogue, he says something from Isaiah 61, which is basically, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because Jehovah hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to heal up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of Jehovah's favor. And he stopped there. 
the rest of this verse from Isaiah says, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, the prophecy that Jesus quoted doesn't say the day of vengeance of our Lord. That's because in his first advent, he wasn't going to take the earth back. The day of vengeance happens through the great tribulation that's yet coming on this earth. Well, what else had the Lord prepared? You know, Alexander of Macedon, the great conqueror, because of his conquest from, oh, roughly 336 to 323 BC, implemented Greek language called Koine form of the Greek language, which is, uh, along with Greek culture, more generally uh, <clears throat> referred to as Hellenism, and it was implemented across the empire that he conquered. It became the standard language for commerce and government, existing right alongside many local languages. Now, Greek was adopted as a second language by the native people of these regions and was ultimately transformed into what had come to be called the Hellenistic Koine or Common Greek. Koine, excuse me. <clears throat> you can see from the map here that the entire area that's designated in yellow is where Alexander had conquered. So look at that. Everybody's speaking Greek. Everybody can read Greek. They know it. Now the New Testament was written in this Koine Greek and it's a language uh, that uh, was part of the world now and everybody knew it well and it was communicated easy by the people across many cultures and countries. However, for these people to move around and begin to evangelize and spread Christianity, they had to have a means of moving. <clears throat> this is where I want to talk about the Roman roads that facilitated the spread of Christianity. Now, the Roman road system expended, uh, excuse me, extended from Great Britain to the Tigris Euphrates and from the Danube <clears throat> in the north to Spain and northern Africa. The Romans built 50,000 miles of hard surfaced highways, but it was primarily for military means. The first of the Roman roads is called the Via Appia, or the Appian Way. It was built by a man named Appius Claudius Caesus in 312 BC, and it originally ran southeast from Rome, about 162 miles to Tarentum that's now called Tarento, but by the beginning of the second century BC, four other great roads radiated out from Rome, the Via Aurelia, the Via Flaminia, Amelia, and Via Valeria. <clears throat> now, the Via Latinia ran southeast and joined the Via Appia near uh, Capua. Uh, the numerous feeder roads from them exceeded far into the Roman province, in, in, in provinces, and it led to this proverb that all roads lead to Rome. You know, the Roman roads were very straight. <clears throat> they had solid foundations. They had cambered surfaces, which meant that the road in the middle was a little higher, and so the water would drain off of them. And they made use of uh, a concrete that they made from um, pozzolana and lime. Now, pozzolana is volcanic ash. These Roman engineers knew what they were doing, and they followed basically the same principles in building abroad as they did in Italy. The Roman system <clears throat> was made possible by Roman conquests and administration, and later they provided for highways for the great migrations into the empire. But more importantly, it was a means for the rapid expansion of Christianity. So, you know, it's interesting that despite the, interior, the deterioration from neglect, it continued to serve Europe through the Middle Ages, and uh, many of these pieces still survive today. I've seen them in Scotland and Great Britain, even. <clears throat> They're still there. They did such a wonderful job. And you can see from the map here what the Roman Empire is, and it's highlighted in red. And you can see the extent of those roads and how Christianity could just easily move with evangelizers, starting with Jesus and the apostles, out through that empire. You know, God sent his Messiah in the fullness of time. He gave the prophets the exact time that he would appear. 
He prepared the way for Jesus' appearance at the perfect time. There was a great anticipation among the Jews and the Romans of the time that Jesus, the Messiah, would come. Rome had unified much of the world under its government and it was giving a sense of unity and peace to the various lands. I mean, the Pax Romana was well known. You know, we have a tendency to think of these Romans as uh, nasty, conquering people. They were conquerors and in order to get control of regions, they were nasty. There's no question about it. But once they did, all they wanted was peace and they wanted nice times with peaceful lands. Um, the whole reason that they even came up with crucifixion was to stop the terrorists, the insurrectionists. They didn't crucify normal people. No, they let them go. They wanted to flourish in this peace. So you got the peace of Rome, and you got these Roman roads, so travel was possible, and it allowed the early Christians to spread the gospel. <clears throat> And in the beginning, the Romans just viewed the gospel and Christianity as another cult. They accepted all their own cults. They just never thought much about this. <clears throat> you know, such a travel and such an ability would have been it would would have been impossible in any other time period. Now, while Rome had conquered militarily, Greece had conquered culturally in the common form of the Greek language. Koine was available everywhere. The Jewish synagogue had become prevalent across Roman Empire, and the places of religious of learning were there when Jesus came. The mystery religions of the time emphasized a savior God, and it required worshipers to offer bloody sacrifices. Now, these are these pagan religions. <clears throat> So when the gospel of Christ, the perfect sacrifice, came to them, they looked at it and they thought, oh my goodness, this, this must be. The Roman army recruited soldiers from amongst these provinces, such as the gospel, uh, and, 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 and excuse me, gave them these ideas, such as the gospel. And they went out to these other regions and introduced the Christian religion there through the roads, through the Greek language, into the synagogues, God himself stepped forth in divine intervention to bring hope and freedom to mankind. Just like a father has chosen a time for his child to be designated as an adult, so too did our Heavenly Father choose the time to bring Christ, his Son, to earth. He designated the perfect time of all of world history <clears throat> to send himself in the body of a human body, Lord Jesus, to make provision for the people's transition from bondage under the law or pagan cults to spiritual sonship. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. If you would like a DVD of today's program, please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877 706 2479. That's 877-706-2479. Once again, 877-706-2479. The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. 
We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you. To the land of Zion, next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Habaa, the Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done next year. The Shana Habaa, the Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there. 